So uh, I said a couple of months ago, and it's not because, you know, th th this is just trend watching here, uh, not crystal balling, that, and I mean, I don't mean crystal ball. I like crystal balls work. I mean crystal balls. <laughs> Remember, you know, you know crystal ball? Remember her? I don't know. No, you don't. There was literally used to, I think she's still, I don't know where she's at now, but she was a Democratic pundit on uh, MSNBC. She literally was called Crystal Ball. I hope she didn't take offense to every time somebody said, let's oh, Crystal Ball this. I don't mean, I mean the concept Crystal Ball, not the actual <laughs> pundit. Yeah. Please don't take offense. Um, that the alt-right and global white nationalists were all over the idea of land reform and expropriation without compensation in South Africa. Now, this has a long history, obviously, in South Africa, and it's a simple history for purposes of this. I'm going to go into this much more deeply uh, on Friday on the Michael Brooks show because we'll have more time. But obviously, look, South Africa was governed by an apartheid regime, uh, which sort of didn't, I would say, fully, I mean, it transitioned in the late 80s and early 90s, and it ended, uh, you know, fully with the election of Nelson Mandela as president in 1994. The economic arrangements were not really touched. And people like Ronnie Casarols, who was an ANC operative and revolutionary, who served in Mandela and in Becky's government, so I've had the privilege of interviewing several times, he said, we had a political but not an economic liberation. And that's one of the reasons that South Africa has had... Um, corruption problems, has ongoing security problems, and uh, inequality. There needs to be a orderly, nonviolent reclaiming and redistribution of some land. And everybody accepts that. In fact, that was part of the initial 1994 moderate rainbow constitution. The ANC currently under Cyril Ramaphosa, who is a billionaire, and very much of the Davos set is implementing a very modest, very modest land expropriation without compensation. We're not talking about what happened in Zimbabwe. And I'll just mention that for a second because in Zimbabwe, and the racism of this is obvious, okay? Zimbabwe is the big freak out example that people use because Mugabe ordered out white farmers uh, in uh several years ago. I don't remember the specific dates when Mugabe began that program. But what he did was essentially get, uh, give to uh, he, political cronies he rewarded and kicked people off of productive for, uh, farms, right? There wasn't a structure to it. There wasn't really much of a design to it. And it was an abusive process. But the process the idea of land reform has never been called into account by anybody involved in any type of liberation struggles. And the reason for that is obvious because this land was literally stolen and you can't address the structural inequalities of a place like South Africa without empowering Africa, black farmers as an example. So what they're proposing in South Africa is a modest social democratic uh, an absolutely necessary policy step, which, by the way, if you're on the you know neoliberal end of this, there is a populist, not really left, but very populist uh, party in South Africa called the Economic Freedom Fighters, led by a guy named Julius Malema, who has praised Mugabe. And there's also a resurgence of white Afrikaner sentiment in South Africa. And there's been Israeli paramil Israeli security trainers flown to white South African farms to train them uh, in security forces, going back to the close relationship between apartheid South Africa and Israel, including Israel's support of a nuclear weapons program under the apartheid government. So that's the actual politics and context for it. And it requires some explanation because in the alt-right, there has been a mission to first demonize Nelson Mandela, who of course is more, more of a complex figure than the kind of simplified version we get, but is still undeniably one of the greatest leaders of the 20th century who led an undoubtedly righteous and correct cause and was correctly universally mired and acclaimed, as was the African National Congress, whatever its current problems. They have been attacking the legacy of liberation, 
mirroring the arguments from the 80s that white nationalists around the Reagan administration used. And now they're in a moment when, by the way, these are just policy talks. There have been no actual government sanctioned land reforms. There have been some violence against white farmers, but that has nothing to do with either a policy directive of the African National Congress government in any way, shape, or form, and has more to do with crime problems in South Africa, which are due to ongoing structural inequality and have not changed since the 90s. They might have accelerated in certain areas, but they're not um, sort of a major departure. This is now a major ballywick of white nationalists and racists. And of course, that leads me to be talking about Tucker Carlson, who did this segment. President of South Africa, Cyril Ramaphosa, has begun, and you may have seen this in the press, seizing land from his own citizens without compensation because they are the wrong skin color. That is literally the definition of racism. Racism is what our elites say they dislike most. Donald Trump is a racist, they say, but they paid no attention to this at all. In fact, Ramaphosa is one of Barack Obama's favorite leaders in the world. In a speech just a few weeks ago, Obama praised him he praised the racist government of South Africa and Ramaphosa by name for, quote, inspiring hope throughout the country. Does our current bureaucratic elite agree with that? So this is an insane, paranoid, and again, a demented read of a guy who has become, I believe, actually a billionaire when he was deployed by the ANC into the private sector. And the most salient critiques of Silo Ramaphosa are things like his uh, essentially being complicit, as far as I understand, in the Maracana massacre in 2012 when he was on a board of directors of a mining company uh, where police killed striking miners. On Thursday in the Financial Times, Ramaphosa, and I just like, just want to underline, he outlined his land program in the Financial Times. He didn't write it for Counterpunch. It wasn't on a Posadas podcast. This was the Financial Times. He wrote, among the greatest obstacles to growth is the severe inequality between black and white South Africans. For the South African economy to reach its full potential, it is necessary significantly to narrow gaps in income, skills, assets, and opportunities. Okay, this is perfect centrist neoliberal discourse. Land ownership is one of the areas where this disparity is most devastating, he writes, citing the World Bank and listing it as the second biggest obstacle in fighting poverty after skills. That's the World Bank, another bastion of globalist communism. But, you know, I say that in sarcasm. Look at the frame in that segment. Tucker is actually saying that. He is actually going not only alt-right, but John Bircher there, that institutions like the World Bank are communist. And so he explains that the ANC's, and I'm quoting now from a South African summary of this, the ANC's position on changing the constitutions on, uh, to enable comp expropriation without compensation, saying that while the constitution currently doesn't prohibit it, the ANC's view is that an amendment would provide certainty and clarity. He emphasizes that the amendment would need to reinforce the fundamental principles of the property cause, including the prohibition of, quote, the arbitrary deprivation of, uh, of property and outline some instances where the expropriation of without compensation might be justified. Listen to how unbelievably moderate this would actually be in practice. Unused land. This is Ramaphosa. Unused land, derelict buildings, purely speculative land holdings, or circumstances where occupiers have a strong historical rights and title holders do not hold occupy or use this land, such as labor tenancy, informal settlements, and abandoned inner city buildings. Okay, not only are these policies right for South Africa, they should be implemented here. They should be implemented in the United Kingdom. They should be implemented everywhere. That list has nothing about violence. It has nothing about removing people from a home to reward a, a, a political crony, as did partially happen in Zimbabwe. So the objections to this are pure racism, white paranoia, white identity politics, and the creeping fear of global oligarchy, because the implications of a policy as moderate as that is maybe at some point there is going to be some small measure of public accountability for the rentier class globally, starting with the most obscene, which is like 
the extension of literally the mass stolen land of South Africa, which created the apartheid state, whose economic mechanisms are still in place going back to the 1990s because the fundamental economic arrangements weren't touched after the essential and necessary liberation. I said a couple of months ago that this racism and this conspiracy theory theories were going to uh, work their way to our racist, addled, stupid, uh, but Twitter perceptive president. And here he is last night. This is Donald Trump. I have asked Secretary of State Mike uh, Sec at Sec Pompeo to closely study South African land and farm seizures and expropriations and the large scale killing of farmers. South African government is now seizing land from white farmers, quote unquote, at Tucker Carlson at Fox News. Now, again, there have been some terrible stories of people being hurt on farms that fits into a broader problem of inequality and violence in South Africa, which, by the way, if you want to talk about the history of violence in South Africa and who might have learned some of these techniques, uh, one would have to f study the history. Well, last thing I'll add, I mean, people say, oh, how could the Congo have such examples of, how could, how could some uh, factions in the Congo Civil War be so violent? Where did they learn to do things like, you know, cut off people's hands? I don't know, maybe from the Belgian occupiers that skin people's bodies alive when they didn't, uh, you know, work efficiently enough at uh, extracting resources for colonial occupiers. There's always a history to these things. And once again, what Ramaphosa has outlined is, and I'll just quote one more time, unused land, derelict buildings, purely speculative land holdings, or circumstances where occupiers have a strong historical rights and title holders do not occupy or use this land, such as labor tenancy, informal settlements, and abandoned inner city buildings. You have a centrist third way government headed by an incredibly wealthy lawyer who is moderate and taking to the Financial Times to say that there will be a small, modest step in paving a way forward for the poor of South Africa in the future, as well as addressing still lived historical profound injustices. And now it's a cudgel of the worst people and most dangerous people in the world from scum uh you know trolls on youtube and twitter to the president of the united states and that is the reality of what's happening and that's the reality of what we'll continue monitoring i'm sorry it took a while with that but to me it is really important